Well, good evening once again. I'm a grateful Christian who struggles with love, abandonment issues, low self-esteem, anger, and my name is Bob. I'm glad to be here tonight, even though it's hot, but I think we'll make it. So, did you guys feel any effects of that fan at all? A little bit? Okay. Well, tonight we're going to continue our lesson series. We are doing lesson number 11, I think it's uh, Spiritual Inventory Part 2. Does everybody have their materials? You should have a, uh, a, a package with a blue front on it. That's the forms package. And then you should have a handout, which is the uh, inventory guide. If you don't have those, then go back and get them, because you're going to need those as I talk about them tonight. The last several weeks, we have been doing a series on inventory, that dreaded word, inventory. This is the heart and soul of uh, recovery. This is where we spend time looking at our past histories trying to find out the reasons why we have hurts and habits and hang-ups. This is a vital part of our recovery program. Very essential that we do this, otherwise we're going to have nothing to really work on or focus on. Now in our first lesson we talked about the forms that we use in the inventory program, and, and, that, and those are the forms that are in the blue package. Everybody should have one of those. The second lesson that we talked about, uh, we talked about specific areas in which we are, we are to perform inventory analysis. And those four areas were Relationships, priorities, attitudes, and integrities. Tonight we're going to cover the third and last lesson in our inventory series. And we're going to talk about four more areas where we will do more inventory analysis. Now, you also should have a bulletin package. I want you to take the bulletin package and find your, uh, there's a note sheet inside. And I want you to take it out. It's a single page note sheet. And I want you to, and you'll notice rather that there are four fill-ins on the note sheet. And these represent the four areas of examination that we are going to be looking at tonight. I'm going to give you the four fill-ins now, and then we're going to go back and talk about each one. So the first fill-in is your mind. If you want to write that in uh, now, that would be a good time to do it, your mind. Second fill-in is your body. Third fill-in is your family, and the fourth fill-in is your church. So it's mind, body, family, church. Those are the four fill-ins. Those represent the four areas of analysis that we're going to look at tonight. So let's take a look at the first one, which is your mind. And right below your fill-in there for mind, there is a scripture. Everybody see that? And it reads, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's Romans 12, 2. So what is the pattern of this world that this passage is talking about? Well, very simply, it's how the world thinks. You know, the world's got some really interesting ideas about life and how we are to relate to one another. For example, the world says, pretty much, that you, meaning us, we determine what we do. In other words, we are in charge of our lives. That's a world idea, commonly proffered by the world, and it's an incorrect idea. The world says is if it feels good, then go ahead and do it. Once again, you're in charge of your life. If you think something is good, then go ahead and do it. The world says look out for number one. If you don't look out for yourself, nobody else will. The world says the end justifies the means. And on and on and on. There's lots and lots of ideas that the world proffers. And uh, on the other hand, by comparison, the Bible gives us God's perspective on life, which is much different than the world's perspective. And Romans 12, 2 says that when we put God's perspective into our minds and we start thinking like God, it's going to change the way we think. And we are going to reject the world's perspective. The Bible says it's going to renew our minds. That means it makes our minds new, and we start thinking like God. All right, so now I want you to take your inventory guide. That's the uh, other handout that you have. It's a big package. It's written on, on the front. It says inventory guide. Everybody has one of those? Okay. And I want you to turn to the section entitled Inventory Guide, e Lesson Number 11. It's about four pages from the back. From the back. If you go to turn it over and then peel back four pages or so, you will find lesson 11. 
Everybody have it? Okay. I want you to locate Roman numeral one at the top of the page entitled Your Mind. Your Mind. Everybody see that? And below that heading, you're going to see a question. And the question is, do I guard my mind? Now, I want you to follow along with me as I go through this guide. This is very important. This is information you're going to be using in the future as you do this type of analysis. So I want you to be familiar with it. Now, there's all kinds of stuff competing for our attention. For example, there's a lot of secular philosophies out there. There's a proliferation of self-help programs. There's lots and lots of New Age books and New Age thinkers. There's all kinds of information available on talk shows and things like that. There's a whole bunch of information out there. And so we need to filter this material by asking ourselves some key questions. Once again, follow along with me in your guide there. Is what I'm hearing edifying or not? In other words, does it build me up or, or the opposite, does it tear me down? Is what I'm hearing true or not? See, doing this kind of evaluation is called guarding our minds. We're, we're looking at what's going into our minds, the potential of what's coming into our minds. We're evaluating whether it's good or bad. That's guarding our minds. One of, one of the best ways to, to, to do that is to compare what we hear with what God says in the Scriptures. See, that's what Romans 12, 2 is talking about. It says, be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. Put God's thoughts into your head. Don't put the world's thoughts into your head. Put God's thoughts into your head. Changes your thinking. And therefore, you're going to know when you hear something that's not right. Something that the world says is right. And you're going to know that. Next question. B, in your handout there, or your guide rather, is am I in denial? Now, we already talked about denial in our first lesson when we first started Celebrate Recovery. However, many of us today are still in various stages of denial. I hear it all the time. So here's some questions that you can ask yourself to see if this is true for you. Do I still refuse to acknowledge my problems? You know, I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. I don't want to stop eating sugar. You know, and sugar's not good for me. So am I refusing to acknowledge my problem? Do I refuse to submit to Christ? You know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Do I avoid reality? Do I rationalize my behavior? Do I make excuses? Do I cover up? See, if I do any of these things, even into a minor degree, I'm in some, some phase or some stage of denial. Next question. Do I fill my mind with garbage? Am I preoccupied with unhealthy stuff? <laughs> now, we've already talked about guarding our minds, and here we're specifically talking about unhealthy stuff. Now, this stuff is everywhere, and most of the time we're not even aware of it. It's in our movies, TV programs, magazines, books, newspapers. It's even in our music. And if we regularly or... or you know, regularly let unhealthy stuff come into our minds, it's going to produce unhealthy thinking. That's just how it works. See, unhealthy thinking, in turn, produces unhealthy behavior. That's the sequence. See, everything starts up here. Everything starts in the mind. Putting negative, bad, horrible stuff into our minds produces negative, bad, horrible behavior. That's how it works. Now, contrary to popular belief, we can control what we think. Psychologists tell us that we cannot think two thoughts at the same time. So a good thought and a bad thought cannot occupy our minds at the same time. So it's important to be actively involved with what we think. So if, as we are evaluating our thinking, if we discover that we have some bad thoughts or unproductive thoughts or evil thoughts, we need to replace them with good thoughts. See, that's a proactive process. That's something that we do, not passive. There's a passage in your handout there. I want you to look at it. It's from Philippians. Paul says, and now, dear brothers, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable 
think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Notice the focus of this passage. It's being proactive with our thought life. See, Paul says, take control of your thoughts. He says, fix your thoughts. That's taking control. All right, the next question in your guide there is, do I spend regular time in the Scriptures? Do I read the Bible? And do I implement what it says? Do I have regular daily quiet times? See, a daily quiet time is spending time alone with God each day at a specific time and a specific place. It's putting God's Word into our minds through Bible study, spending time in prayer, talking to God, and doing self-examination, evaluating what, what, what I'm doing over the past day or two or so. And then it's recording the results of these activities in my journal. That is a daily quiet time, and it's essential for, for living the Christian life. Everybody needs to be doing this. This is a Christian discipline that everybody needs to do. Okay, how can we use this information? Let's say we've gone through this evaluation process now. How can we use this information in our inventories? Well, what we can do is we can add it to columns three through five for each event that we have already recorded on our inventory sheet. So what I recommend you do is after you finish each sheet, just one sheet at a time in your inventory package, go back and evaluate your state of mind at the time each event occurred. Ask yourself, what was my thought life like at the time this person or circumstance affected me? And do that for each event, positive or negative. What bad ideas, or maybe good ideas even, did I accept and follow? What, was I in denial? Did I ignore God? And how did all this influence what happened? See, as we collect this information, we add it to our forms. So what that means is, as you fill out your inventory forms initially, leave some extra room in each box. Each box that you fill, leave a little extra room in so that you might add some information later as you go back and do this. I call this second layer or second tier evaluation. So you've already evaluated your events and circumstances. Now you're going back and you're figuring out what your state of mind was at the time the event occurred. All right, the next area to examine, back to your guide, is your body. Sorry, not to your guide. I want you to go back to your single sheet note sheet in your bulletin package. Pull that back out again and find the fill-in where you put in your body. Okay? And look at the scripture that's right beneath it. It says, haven't you yet learned that your body is the home of the Holy Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit God gave you, and he lives within you. Your own body does not belong to you. This passage is very startling. It says, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. In other words, our bodies are his home. They're often called his temple. See, God lives in temples and since he indwells in our bodies, our bodies are temples. So the question is, what is the condition of my temple? Is it a mansion? Or is it a hut? Something to take a look at. Here's some things to think about as we consider this question. Do I abuse alcohol, tobacco, drugs, food, sex, and so on? Do I get enough sleep? That's an interesting area. This is an area that's often overlooked. But studies have shown, many studies actually have shown that Americans are a nation of tired people. These same studies show that the average person needs between seven and eight hours of sleep a night. However, Americans generally get considerably less sleep than that. And this shortened sleep period affects the body's ability to replace key chemicals that are necessary to sustain daily life. Our bodies need certain chemicals, and if they don't have an opportunity to get those replaced by sleep, then the body's deprived. And the absence of these chemicals causes organ breakdown and disease. So getting sleep is critical. Next question is, how well do I handle stress? See, stress produces adrenaline. Adrenaline is designed to handle emergencies. It peaks at the moment of crisis so that we can effectively deal with the emergency. But adrenaline, after it peaks, has to abate. 
However, our lifestyles are often in a state of continuous crisis. And as a result, we maintain high levels of adrenaline, adrenaline on a continuous basis. And this can cause serious damage to internal organs as well. Our hearts and our livers and other organs are directly impacted by high levels of sustained adrenaline. Next question is, do I worry excessively? Do I exercise regularly? Do I eat nutritionally? Do I take regular vacations? Do I take regular breaks from the routine? And so on. Now again, the question comes up, how can we use this information in our inventories? And once again, we can add it to the columns three through five for each event that we have already recorded in our inventory sheet, just like we did for the last category. See, physical well-being often impacts how we deal with life and how we deal with life situations. So the physical side of it is very important to look at. The question is, what was my physical state at the time the events occurred? All right, that's the second category. The third category I want to look at is your family. Once again, go back to your single sheet from your bulletin package, please, and find the scripture that's right beneath your fill-in. It says, but if you are unwilling to obey the Lord, then decide today whom you will obey. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's from Joshua 24, 15, pretty famous passage. Now in this passage, Joshua is committing his family and himself to serving the Lord. And we can see that Joshua has the best interests of his family at heart. And this should be true of us as well. So let's go back to our guide now and look at the questions related to this area. First question is, in your guide, have I mistreated members of my family? Have I been physically abusive? Have I been emotionally abusive? Have I engaged in excessive yelling? Have I put family members down? Have I distanced myself? In other words, have I been remote? Have I manipulated anyone using uh, unhealthy methods to get what I want? Have I been apathetic? You know, exhibiting an I don't care attitude, an indifferent attitude. Now, as leaders of our families, we must provide proper emotional and physical environments conducive to growth and development. So does my family feel safe? It's a bottom line question. Are they accepted? This is all in your guide there. Are they affirmed? Are they protected and valued? Do I have resentment towards family members? And the questions can go on and on. Now we can also use this, this information rather in our inventories as well. The question is, how does my family fit into the various events that I recorded in my inventory sheet? Specifically, did I cause problems for them, or did they cause problems for me, and what did I do about them at the time they happened, and today even, and how did they impact me today? This information, once again, can be recorded in the boxes in columns three through five, so once again, it's important to leave room in our inventory sheets as we progress through each event. Last category is your church. Once again, go back to your single note sheet in your bulletin package, please. Find the scripture that's below the fill-in. And it says, And let us not neglect our meetings, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of His coming back is drawing near. That's Hebrews 10, 25. This passage is very significant. It defines the importance of Christians meeting together. See, there is no such thing as Lone Ranger Christians. It says fellow believers encourage us to follow God, and they warn us when we get off track. So let's go back to your inventory guide and look at the questions there related to church. Everybody there at the inventory guide? First question is, do I regularly attend church? Do I help out? Do I pitch in? Am I involved or am I indifferent? Do I connect with other people when I'm at church or do I just run in and run out? See, many Christians just sit on the sidelines and go to church on Sunday and they don't do anything else. 
getting involved in church activities with church people is edifying, meaning it's building, it builds us up. It's therapeutic. And why is that? Because somehow God works through people. It's his favorite way of working. That's why we, he encourages us to be together so he can use individuals in our lives to build us up. Now, once again, we can use this information in our inventory analysis. Question is, did I ignore my church family at the time the events I am reviewing occurred? What problems did that cause? And once again, this information can be recorded in columns three through five on your inventory sheet as appropriate. Now, I have to tell you, this is a lot of information. Some of it may not apply. Some of it will. But as you go through this, you're going to be able to sort out what does and what doesn't and then fill it in accordingly. All right, so what I'd like to do now is summarize. Here are some points I would like you to remember. Number one, perform your inventory analysis carefully and honestly. Once again, don't be in a hurry to do this. You know, you're not going to examine your whole life at one time. You're only going to be looking at a small part of it. And as you do this, talk to the Lord continuously and also meet continuously and regularly with your sponsor. See, a sponsor is a vital part of this process. God speaks to us very often through sponsors. And then make sure you record what you discover in your forms. Now, getting back to the process, do this one event at a time. Look at small time periods. Don't go back too far. Just pick a time period that's comfortable for you, maybe the past year, past two years, whatever it happens to be, and just look at that period and get all the information you can for that particular event for that particular time period. And once you're satisfied with that, then move on to the next one. Start today. Work back one period at a time. And then make sure you alternate positive and negative events. Don't do all negative events, because if you do too many negative events, you're going to get defeated. You're going to be overwhelmed, and you're going to want to stop. So that's very important to alternate positive and negative events. Now, if you think, well, I can't think of enough positive events, then you're not looking hard enough. You know, these positive events don't have to be super duper. You know, it can be just anything that we've done that's positive, and make sure you put it in there. And then also use the eight categories that we've talked about in these last two lessons for examination. And just by way of review, these categories are relationships, priorities, attitudes, integrities, our minds, our bodies, our families, and our church. Information on how to evaluate these categories is in your guide. That inventory guide that you have is a vital document. It contains all the information you're going to need for doing your inventory analysis. Make sure you use it along with your meetings with your sponsors. Okay, that concludes my remarks for this evening. I would like to close with a serenity prayer. So let's put the serenity prayer up and everybody please stand and pray with me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Thank you very much. You may now go to your groups. And if there's any first-timers here tonight, I'd like to meet you over here by the flag. And thank you.